Anybody ever seen the Andy Griffith show? I love how Barney Fife kept order in that town. Not a bullet in the gun. Love that Don Knotts. Where is he going today? Like that Don Knotts. I mean, that Don Knotts is a good guy. I tell you who's another one. Uh, Chuck Yeager. Who knows who Chuck Yeager is? Broke the sound barrier. First man to break sound barrier. With cracked ribs, I might add. Love that guy. Fantastic. Never been on a supersonic jet, but maybe one day they'll recommission the Condor or something. But um, I'm not going to be a fighter pilot, you know. Some things you learn to live with. Don Knotts, Chuck Yeager. What was the other thing? West Virginia. Love West Virginia. I mean, what's a state bird? What's a state flower? What's a state song? <laughs> Everybody pauses for that one. Why bringing up all three of those things? Mother's Day is from West Virginia. So much good from our state. So happy Mother's Day, ladies. All you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. And hopefully you can share that little bit of tidbit, of, uh, those tidbits of information with your children and grandchildren today at dinner about how we have influenced television. We've influenced space and flight and families as West Virginians celebrating Mother's Day. I've always enjoyed that. Please open in your Bible or your handout to the book of Acts. While we are marking Mother's Day today in our cultural calendars, the church calendar is drawing our attention to something that is based upon another thing that's usually overlooked. And I alluded to that, Max actually preached about it a great deal Thursday night for the Feast of the Ascension itself, properly speaking. You see, the Bible tells us that for 40 days, our Lord Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, walked around with the apostles, interpreting the Scripture to them, explaining what the Bible really means. For 40 days, they got another post-resurrection series of Bible studies with the Lord Jesus. Six weeks. I think that could be qualified as the school of Christ in a very particular way. Then the Scripture gives us this very, very significant event that again we overlook, overlook and we ought not to. Christ ascends into heaven after that 40-day period. He goes up, He leaves the world and goes back into heaven and sits down at the right hand of God. There He is in session right now. The kingdom of God has already been inaugurated. It's already started. And he must reign until all of his enemies are put beneath his feet. But he does something pretty, pretty incredible, as all of his works are. He starts to prepare the disciples for his absence by giving them a promise that someone just like him would soon follow after. That's the Holy Spirit. And we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit next Sunday in the new building on Pentecost. But today, we're here. And today, we need to talk about the necessary apostleship that was so necessary that the Holy Spirit would not come until the number of apostles was completed. So let's look at this right here. Waiting... For the Holy Spirit. Theology, as I've said many times, is bound up in prepositions. And prepositions are sometimes really difficult to translate. Anybody in here speak a language other than English? Check that out. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm going to venture that if I say, Tengo hombre. That's the answer. But what's the translation? Uh, I what? I am hungry. But I th didn't I just say two words? Tango, hombre? How's that three words? 
You see, theology is in prepositions. And some languages have prepositions. Some have the prepositions that are not distinct words, but they're attached as a prefix or a suffix. I'm not going to get more complicated than that. Just pointing out that translating from one language to the next is not always easy. So you notice often in your modern Bibles, in the footnotes, it'll say or, and it gives you a couple different ways a text could be read. Usually, that's revolving around prepositions in the Greek text. Because Greek has a couple different words that can be translated lots of different ways in English. So how do you know what the preposition is, or should be, I guess, in our language, by the context of the larger text? Words themselves are like that. If I say that I like the color red, what am I talking about? Am I talking about red? Am I talking about that red? Am I talking about that red? Am I talking about this wonderful red? Am I talking about this red? So colors have variations of their shades, right? They, they vary like that. Words are the same way. There's variation in meaning. So your three points this morning all begin with the word waiting. In each instance, there's a different nuance to the word. Because often we get stuck in delay and we get bent out of shape. Let me, let me, let me just let, me let down my little bit of hair. Few things provoke me as, as bureaucratic unnecessities. You like how I put all that together to make it even more bumbly? When things aren't administered properly, it's frustrating. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you, you, you're a so type B personality that you could sit in at the DMV and you're totally cool. You can go to Walmart or any other store and stand there at the checkout lane and they got 16 cash registers and one person working. And you think, I, why don't you all bring the prices down? Um, you're, i I got to pay you to wait here. You don't have to, you don't have to agree, right? Because you may not be that way. But I know for a fellow like myself, unnecessary delays because of bad management is as frustrating as almost anything on the planet. (laughs) But the Lord never delays like that. And He never causes us to wait like that. In fact, when He is delaying a thing, when He is causing us to wait, it's so that we learn to wait. And one of the ways that we can redeem time, even in those awful bad management events, is figure out how to wait on the Lord in the midst of those other delays that are unpleasant. That takes us into point one. In this 10-day period, from Jesus' ascension to the descent of the Holy Spirit, you see, because that's what's happening. He, He had to come down. He came down and was incarnate from the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit. And so he, he empties himself of divine prerogatives. He's still fully God, but he doesn't walk around as God. He walks around as a man with the limitations of a man. He gets hungry. He gets tired. He gets sleepy. He gets cranky. He sanctifies crankiness. <laughs> Do you give space to yourself to be a little unpleasant and then go take a nap? Jesus did, so should you. But he experiences all of humanness in this sense, right? All all of what it means to be be a man, to be physical, to be be limited by that. But then at the ascension, you see, the resurrection is not the exaltation. The resurrection is when he comes back to life and he brings humanity into glory. He's transforming what it even means to be dead now. So that to be dead is to be with God in his presence when you're in Christ. But here at the ascension is now when as a man he goes up into glory to the highest of the heights of the heavens and he sits down at the right hand of power with everything beneath his feet absolutely, utterly sovereign 
anything that he wants happens. I shared with the folks on Friday at our Friday Eucharist that spiritual warfare is the indicator that Jesus is reigning. Spiritual conflict is the evidence that he's in charge, not the absence being the evidence. But there he is in fullness now, fully transfigured, fully glorified, majestic. So he came down and limited himself to being a slave, to dying upon the cross, that he might rise and then ascend into the fullness of glory, so that the fullest, fullness of glory that he has there, he now brings to us in the Spirit. But between those two events is this 10-day period, ascension tide. And the apostles are waiting on the Holy Spirit. They don't know who he is. They don't know what it's going to be like. Now, Jesus has been telling them, it's going to be like me, guys. Like, get that through there. How can you say, show us the Father? Have I been with you so long and you don't get it? Well, Lord, how are you going to reveal yourself? The spirit of truth. Yeah, but what is it? Adventures in missing the point with the apostles. But they've got enough sense at this point to wait for the Holy Spirit. This is where the theology is tied up in the prepositions. They say in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, those first set of verses for you in your handout, Jesus says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, is, is what Ezekiel saw when the glory came back to the temple, is that going to happen now? Are you going to restore the glory to Israel? Is the kingdom coming back to Israel? And a simple reading of Jesus' response would seem like he doesn't answer them. But he does answer them. And he answers them on the basis of the interpretation that he has been giving them since he's risen from the dead his explanation of the text. He says this to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. What he's saying is you're thinking, you, you've got to shift how you're perceiving this, and some of the stuff that you're wanting to know about the end, it's not going to be told to you guys. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What he's saying is the kingdom will come upon you. That's where the kingdom will be. Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When he walked around amongst the disciples and hang, hung out with the Pharisees, he would say things like, the kingdom is in your midst, talking about himself as the king of the kingdom. And so when, when they say, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He's saying, you guys are still thinking backwards. The kingdom will be on you. And you will go as my representatives, my witnesses to the whole world and announce that I am king of the nations. I am the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what you will go and bear witness to as I witnesses. But you've got to wait to be clothed with power from on high. These guys, the apostles have already breathed in the Holy Spirit. But they've got to wait for more. They've been set up as the apostles, as the college of apostles. These 12 men representing, oh wait, that's not true. That takes us into point two. Waiting on the Lord Jesus. So they're waiting for the Spirit to come. And now they're waiting on the Lord Jesus. They're obeying everything He's commanded. Notice what Peter does in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. May his camp become desolate. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. I like how the King James translates office. It's bishopric, because the Greek word is episcope. The office of bishop, of oversight, is where that comes from the apostles. 
Notice how Peter goes back to the Psalms. He gets two different verses from the Psalms and interprets them to the apostles and the rest of the early church as to what they should do because that's how Jesus taught them to interpret the Bible. So they're recognizing they've got to wait on the Lord Jesus. They've got to do exactly what he has commanded down to the smallest detail. Do you know that sometimes that's why the delay is present? Because our obedience isn't complete enough. How precise are the apostles? They recognize that since there are only 11 of them, the Holy Spirit can't come yet. John 15, 26 and 27. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Notice how he identifies that. You have been with me from the beginning, so you will be eyewitnesses to everything that I've taught and said. That's what he means. Well, how do we know that's what he means? Look at the next verse. Again, Peter says this to the apostles as they're gathered in the upper room and the other 120 disciples or so. He says, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up. So from Jesus' baptism to his ascension, one of these who have been an eyewitness needs to be with us as the twelve to complete the number twelve. Do you see how, how specific and meticulous they are? How many of us, if we opened up the Bible and started re- reading through the Psalms and came across that line, let his, let his camp be desolate and another take his office, would think that that had anything to do with the apostolic eyewitness testimony that there needs to be 12 apostles? And as a matter of fact, Bible scholars, or Bible students at Bible colleges and seminaries aren't even taught to read the Bible that way. They're taught to read it differently. They're taught to read about what camping meant in the, in the ancient Middle Eastern world. And they talk about how they would construct a tent, maybe. Maybe there's a picture of the different kinds of rocks and stones in Israel and how rough the terrain was so you could really get a visualization for it, which is exactly what the New Testament doesn't do when it goes to interpret the old. It interprets it in light of Jesus Christ and his work. And so here the apostles are being super meticulous because they recognize Judas is gone. He's gone to his own place. He's the son of perdition. He's gone into everlasting destruction. Hell. That's where he's gone. There's only 11 of us. There's got to be 12. He called 12. He trained 12. He said there were 12 thrones that we'd we'd be sitting upon. We can't have an empty throne. The implication is there must be a 12th. So who amongst us was there at the baptism of John and is also there at his ascension, all the ministry of Jesus, which means that there's more than just 12 people following him around in a very consistent, persistent way. Don't expect the Lord to call you forward into service if you're absent. Don't expect him to develop you, develop you for work in the church if you show up late and leave early. If you show up late and stay late, because if you stay after people have left, what good is that? When Moses was called upon by the Lord to select Joshua to replace him, Joshua was, was not just known for being a man of war or being a man who was zealous or jealous for Moses. Joshua would stay at the tent of meeting when Moses left and would continue to seek the Lord. These apostles are waiting on the Lord Jesus, being as obedient to every specific particular thing that they can. Can you imagine the kind of Bible study they were having? What do they call it? The kind of jam session. They're just talking back and forth with each other about, well, he said this, and what did he mean there? And he said this one, and what did he mean about that? Well, what else should we do here because of this? Can you imagine the kind of conversations they're having? And in the midst of this time of prayer, because that's the other thing. The Scripture is very clear. While the early church, roughly 120 of them, actually, you know what? That's probably not true, Elijah. Paul says that there were 500 that saw him as eyewitnesses. 
And so there's a lot of commentators who think that, that the 500 who saw him saw him leave at the ascension. And the 500 go from the, the Mount of Olives, where the ascension happens, into the upper room in Jerusalem. By the day of Pentecost, 10 days later, there's 120 left. 500 people, 120 remain. Where'd the other people go? They didn't stay. They left. And they missed the descent of the Holy Spirit. The apostles are being meticulous. So in this 10-day period, they're praying together, and they're already in a spirit of unity. We heard that from John 17. Jesus prayed for the unity of the apostles, and they are already unified. The church already unified before the descent of the Holy Spirit. So people who say, because and again, oh, I'm trying to stay on point here. Father Mitch, we've heard this in a lot of the, a lot of the church circles we've been in. Well, we just need revival. We just need revival. We just need the Holy Spirit to come. What does that mean? We just need revival. I was talking to somebody about drop cloths the other day. Anyway, that's a story I can't get into. I bring this up because we're looking for some spiritual fix to zap us from the sky. But if the apostles, before the descent of the Spirit, could already live with a spirit of unity, constant prayer, and fellowship, what is our excuse? Since we live on this side of receiving the Spirit. We need to follow their example here. We need to be waiting on the Holy Spirit for more of Himself to be be at work in our lives in a tangible way. And we need to be waiting on the Lord Jesus, doing the minutia, obeying the details. He says that the apostles will be His eyewitnesses. Here's their eyewitness testimony. The 27 books of the New Testament, while they're not all written by the 12 apostles, are congruent with that testimony, which is why so many of them did write portions of these letters. And the letters that aren't written by them are referring to them frequently and to the teaching and the preaching of the Gospels. Without the eyewitness testimony of the apostles, there are no Gospels. Right, Deacon Neal, since you're studying the synoptics? Yes. Do we see that here in the text of Scripture? This is the eyewitness account of the apostles. We need that. Without that eyewitness account, we can't do what the Lord's calling us to do or to be. Where's he at? Oh, he's right there. (laughs) Why are you shaking your head no, son? You don't even know what I'm pointing at you for yet. His middle name is Justice. I got that out of here in Acts chapter 1. He's not not the one who's selected to replace Judas. That's Matthias. Justice goes on to be a prophet in the book of Acts. No pressure, Aiden. Let's look at point three. They're waiting in the Holy Spirit. Wait, if the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet, how are they waiting in the Spirit? Remember the different nuances for the word waiting. All right? They're waiting in the Holy Spirit. Notice the prepositions. In the Spirit. So they're gathered around the apostolic testimony because they're gathered around the apostles themselves. This speaks to how necessary apostleship is. As much as I can hold up this book and say, here is that apostolic testimony, uh, having a book that had the apostolic testimony in one book like this, that you couldn't do that for centuries of Christian history. They didn't even make books like this. So you knew that you were around the apostolic ministry, the apostolic presence, because of bishops, priests, and deacons who had been trained about what the book said and then how to cause that book to be obeyed through the liturgy and things like the church calendar. 
with the advent, there's a double pun right there on church calendar, with the advent of writing and mass, produ- ma- mass production of books, now we can consult the chronicles, the eyewitness testimonies ourselves. For a long time, you couldn't do that. What we have here is the apostles waiting on the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and the whole church is with them. Notice what's happening here in John 20, 21. Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Do you see the the passing of the torch here? The transition of what's happening. Jesus is saying, the Father sent me. I'm going back to him. I'm sending you. And this word as, which is another, what is the word as, Josh? It's a preposition. Here again is some more theology. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Jesus is sent as the Messiah for the whole world. Now, he never really leaves, not really, he never really leaves Israel. I mean, he goes down to, Ale- to Egypt, probably in Alexandria, when he's, when he's a little guy. And he, he goes outside of the boundaries of Israel a few times, like Caesarea Philippi. But he doesn't really leave that part of the world. I mean, there's some cool legends that he f- goes with Joseph of Arimathea to England to Glastonbury and stuff. All that's kind of cool. I mean, you folks that got back from the UK, did you, did you go over to Gla- Glastonbury? No? Missed that one. So there's all kinds of old legends about that stuff. But as far as the Bible goes, he stays basically in Israel. But he's sent to the world as the Father has sent me. So now he's sending them to the rest of the nations to communicate, to preach, to disciple the nations, to be obedient to what he's taught so that they all can come under his lordship. They can all be saved and reconciled to God. Notice the charge he gives the apostles. Jump down to Acts 13. I have it there on your handout. There were at the church in Antioch prophets and teachers. While they were worshiping, and that word worship is where we get the word liturgy. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And in the next chapter, in two different passages, Luke will call Barnabas and Paul apostles. What's happening here, now they're not the 12 apostles, but it's speaking to the dynamic of how the church expands and grows through the messengers that the Holy Spirit sends through the agency of the church. What's happening is that this is speaking to the necessity of apostleship, the necessity of the bishops, the necessity of clergy. That's not really encouraging. Most of the guys I know are dull. Maybe. Some, some are. A lot are. Lord have mercy on us. I mean, I've, I've said a long time ago. Well, I'm not going to repeat that. It's necessary for us to hear the word of God. It's necessary for us to know it. You see, yeah, but I, re- I can read it. Do you know how to obey it? Do you know what it means to live it out? Do you know what it means to see it fully realized in your own heart and in your own life? It's necessary. The formation of clergy is necessary. It doesn't happen quickly. I said this in Sunday school, um, and I mentioned it, I think, in the first service as well. Because I, I believe the Lord's going to continue to raise up more and more men for holy orders here in the church. I think that's, I don't think that's going to go away. So let me tell the church how you could start identifying people whom the Lord's calling. They show up early. They stay late. They serve. They don't direct. They figure out what needs to be done and they do it without being asked. They love the Lord. They desire to study the scripture and they study it. And they're not, they're, they're not told to develop a prayer life. They ask for counsel on how they can continue to pray and develop it. 
And then as I tell the guys who are already in the pipeline, who are already helping set things up, no one should ever be up here to preach, to teach, to lead in prayer, to lead in the confession of the creed, who's not pastorally involved with the church. No one should be so consumed with how they move their hands when they celebrate the Eucharist that they ignore the Holy Spirit or the people in front of them. Shouldn't happen. If they're inconsistent in church attendance, if they're inconsistent in poorly um, engaging in the responsibilities that they're given when they're introductory responsibilities, you as a congregation have a responsibility to say to discernment committees when they begin for people, I don't think that person's ready yet. It doesn't mean that they don't get put forward. It means that that goes into the report. So when a bishop gets that file, he can say, all right, well, it looks like he's, the guy may have a call, but we've got to figure out how we get him more responsible. Send this back to the church and give him some more basic tasks. If he can't start running the vacuum on a regular basis, we don't need him. If a, if a person who's called into the ministry, who's called into vocational orders, can't maintain simple things like a vacuum schedule, he cannot handle the body and blood of Christ. He ought not to touch your soul and to tell you how to live. This is basic stuff, but we're in a world where that stuff's not known anymore. And as I said to the Sunday school class, we try to fix natural immaturity with spiritual maturity. But you can't be spiritually mature if you're naturally immature. That's for all of us. And when you take a study of the apostles, look at what they are like when Jesus calls them. Look at what they're doing when he says, hey, come follow me. Look at how they colossally miss it so much in the three years that he's training them. Even when one is completely overrun by the devil, Simon Peter, he receives the correction and doesn't run away. Whereas Judas, I've got a technical term. I've got two of them. He's a slinker and a stinker. <laughs> he slithers around, ducking behind things, avoiding issues, taking some money every now and then, saying things he wants to say, manipulating circumstances to fit his end. Yeah, but didn't Jesus make him one of the apostles? Not so that we can copy that, but so that we can see it when it's happening and not fall prey to it. You see, we can come across this 10-day period of the apostles waiting on the Lord, waiting for the Holy Spirit, waiting in the Spirit and say, that's great, that was that time, but there's principles there that speak to where we are now. And if we want to be mature Christians, we want to be mature people, not children, tossed around by every wind and wave of doctrine. Did you hear about this revival? Did you hear about that outpouring? Did you read that dream about that guy who was living underneath the rock and he saw the angel feather wings? There are a dime a dozen. Every broken clock is right twice a day. You want to become spiritually mature. You want to become spiritually filled with the holiness of God. You want to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Then feast on this. And do so regularly. Anchor your life in the disciplines of the church. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in truth. He is the spirit of truth. He doesn't bring deception. He doesn't delude. He doesn't deceive. He comes and he speaks the word of God with such clarity that you can't confuse his voice with another. And when God raises up men, hold the line, we support them. We strengthen them because none of us are perfect. And we do everything we can to ensure that they accomplish what the Lord's called them to. Because if they can do what the Lord's called them to do, then the rest of us become the recipients of that blessing that he's giving through them. And that's hard. It's hard on the people when God starts to dislodge them from their comfortable life to obey him. And it's hard on the church to have to say to people when they're raised up, we bless you. Well, why is that hard? Because you tend to like people, I hope. 
But as this church continues to grow, and God sends in more and more people for that kind of training and that kind of forming and that kind of developing in conjunction with everything else, everything else they have to do. It is a blessing for the church, and it calls for a discernment in the church. Stand with me. Here soon the church is going to commemorate on the calendar the martyrs of Sudan. It is estimated from 1983 until 2005, two and a half million Christians were martyred in Sudan. Things like that are hard for us to comprehend. They're hard for us to understand, to wrap our minds around. And I want to just give this, this a, a p- appeal, really, that as you're praying this week and you're thinking about what it is to be in this delay time that the apostles had, and you think about the delays that you've had in your own life, in your own formation, ask the Lord what grace He was working in you in that period. What fortitude of soul, what steel of character was he developing in you that you needed for something that was next that you couldn't see? Because sometimes that call of the Lord produces in a people martyrdom that's two and a half million strong. But think about that army of white-robed martyrs around the throne of God. Think about them seated on thrones in heaven and through their intercession and their prayer changing the course of human events. And how that we are called to participate in divine grace right now, today. And so no matter whether the Lord is calling some into this necessary apostleship, some into the glory of martyrdom, some into regular, faithful pillared, established work in a community which is just as vital as the other two. We do so in and by the grace of God. And may the Lord give each one of you the grace that you need for the particular task that He's called you to. And may every delay that has been frustrating turn out to be a time of fruitfulness and abundance. I think we've got a testimony about some property around that point. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that your mighty hand still rests mightily upon your people. Expel from us, Lord, those, those haunting ideas that say that the, that the challenges was, were, were for naught, but in reality you're working a testimony that cannot be robbed. Thank you for building the battlements with rubies and with precious stones. Thank you, Lord. We pray that our ears can hear you, Holy Spirit. In Christ's mighty name, amen. Please remain standing as we now confess the faith in the words of the Nicene Creed.